It's The Real News Network, and I'm Greg Wilpert in Baltimore. Following the arrest of Julian Assange in the Ecuadorian embassy in London, one of the questions that has repeatedly come up is why did the government of Ecuador decide to rescind the political asylum and the Ecuadorian citizenship of Julian Assange? Ecuador's President Lenin Moreno justified the decision in a tweeted video as follows. Ecuador is a generous country and a nation of open arms. Our government is respectful of the principles of international law and the institution of the right of asylum. Granting or withdrawing asylum is a sovereign right of the Ecuadorian state, according to international law. Today, I announce that the discourteous and aggressive behavior of Mr. Julian Assange and the hostile and threatening declarations of its allied organizations against Ecuador, and especially the transgressions of international treaties, have led the situation to a point where the asylum of Mr. Assange is unsustainable and no longer viable. Ecuador, sovereignly, has declared to terminate the diplomatic asylum granted to Mr. Assange in 2012. Lenin Moreno's successor, Rafael Correa, had initially granted Assange asylum in Ecuador's London embassy in June 2012 when Swedish authorities tried to have him extradited to Sweden for questioning in a rape allegation. Joining me now to discuss Assange's arrest from an Ecuadorian perspective is Guillaume Long. He's a former foreign minister for Ecuador under President Rafael Correa. Thanks for joining us again, Guillaume. Well, thank you very much for having me on your show. So we just saw a brief clip of uh, President Moreno's explanation for why he decided to allow British police to arrest Assange in the Ecuadorian embassy. And in the full clip, he goes into more detail where he accuses Assange of having disrespected embassy personnel, that he was spying on, uh, on the embassy itself, and that he was intervening in the internal affairs of other countries. What do you make of Moreno's explanation and what do you think is behind the decision to surrender him? Yeah, I think... Uh the explanations given by the president himself, um, if you look at the whole video and the, and the explanations over the last few days, they strike me as quite sort of disheveled and quite incoherent. Um, I think there are two main explanations for uh, Ecuador's uh, revoking the asylum and what we saw yesterday with the arrest of Julian Assange in the Ecuadorian embassy in London. The first is clearly Lenin Moreno's realignment uh, with the United States. I mean, there's been a dramatic change since May 2017, since Moreno came to power, in terms of Ecuador's foreign policy, it's real strong, sort of unambiguous alignment with the Trump administration, and you're seeing changes with regards to policy towards Venezuela, you're seeing uh, Ecuador sort of uh, um, uh, come, getting out of UNASUR, despite the fact that it's uh, UNASUR headquarters, you're seeing uh, on most issues, uh, Chevron Texaco, which was a big issue for Ecuador, and the uh, contamination of the Amazon, where Ecuador, the Ecuadorian state had a very strong position. You're seeing uh, the modern administration uh, moving very close to the U.S. position and going back into the U.S. sphere of influence and sort of abiding to now what is now officially uh, the rebirth of the Monroe Doctrine. And that's one set of reasons. And the recent allegations of the New York Times saying that the IMF loan uh, had been conditions, just been a four billion, a little bit over four billion dollar IMF loan agreed between the IMF and Ecuador, uh, was agreed, and let's not forget the U.S. has a veto uh, within the IMF, uh, was agreed by the United States upon uh, sort of handing over of uh, Julian Assange. That's the one set. Uh, well, that's the first reason. The second reason, I think, is a more sort of personal, I would say, even vindictive uh, reason. Uh, Moreno is facing some very serious corruption allegations. They've just discovered two bank accounts, one in Belize, one in Panama, uh, held by his brother, where uh, it appears that there have been bribes deposited on those bank accounts, and then money spent by Moreno himself uh, in various parts of the world, including in Spain, where he appears to have bought a, a, an apartment. I mean, these are very serious allegations. And recently, there was a massive leak uh, the, the whole scandal is in Ecuador is called the INA papers because the, the offshore company is called INA Investment. And this leak showed uh, through all sorts of leaked emails and chats and all sorts of things, sort of gave more proof and more credence to the uh, accusation, to the corruption scandal. Now, in the recent days, WikiLeaks uh, tweeted about inner papers. I don't think WikiLeaks is necessarily, I mean, I don't have any information, but knowing WikiLeaks and knowing the way they present their information, WikiLeaks doesn't appear to be 
the source of these uh, inner papers materials, but they tweeted about it and made it a sort of um, sort of even more prominent globally, if you like. So I think it's actually a sheer vengeance. You know, it's a personal thing on behalf of Moreno. And when you hear his uh, his sort of uh, reasons that he gives, and then he, uh, he talks about this, uh, you can really see that there's a, a personal grievance. Uh, and I think that's very serious, and it's a very sad indeed if uh, this personal grievance uh, put an end to an asylum that was a matter of state and a matter of international law. Now, Moreno says in his clip also that it is a sovereign right of Ecuador to revoke asylum. Also, he said that the British government agreed to the condition that Assange would not be extradited uh, to a country where he could face torture or the death penalty. Uh, we have a clip here and uh, about what he said about this. In line with our strong commitment to human rights and international law, I request Great Britain to guarantee that Mr. Assange would not be extradited to a country where he could face torture or the death penalty. The British government has confirmed it in writing in accordance with its own rules. So what do you think of um, the legal basis of Assange's expulsion from the embassy? Well, first, you can't revoke asylum. That is a fundamental tenet of international law. You cannot give asylum to someone, you can refuse it, and you don't even have to explain why, you don't have to give any reasons. But you can, once asylum has been given, uh, there is a principle in international law called non refoulement uh, where you cannot, and this is recognized in most uh, bodies and instruments of international law, including the 1954 Caracas Convention, which Ecuador is a, a member, the Convention on Political Asylum, uh, you cannot rescind, revoke an asylum unless the conditions uh, under which the asylum was given uh, have changed, meaning unless the legitimate fear of political persecution or the fear that the human rights of the person, uh, of the asylee, uh, will be uh, jeopardized, unless that fear is, has no more grounds. And in the case of Ecuador, the reason uh, for Ecuador to grant asylum to Julian Assange was the fear of polit political persecution was the fear of an extradition request. So this extradition request was the reason behind uh, Ecuador's, uh, or, or potential extradition request was the reason behind Ecuador's uh, granting of the asylum in 2012. And we're seeing there is an extradition request today. So under no circumstance can Ecuador argue that there's been a change in, uh, or that the situation has been resolved, that there's no more reason to, uh, for Ecuador to have uh, uh, legitimate concerns about uh, political persecution of, of Mr. Assange. So what, it is, what Ecuador is doing by revoking uh, the asylum is uh, actually uh, illegal. So let's backtrack a little bit. Um, <clears throat> what were President Correa's motivations for granting asylum to Assange in the first place? Well, they were, uh, motivations were based on what international law says about political asylum, the fear of political persecution. Uh, when Mr. Assange arrived at the Ecuadorian embassy in June 2012, he explained what his fears were. They were based on the fact that he felt that WikiLeaks was being persecuted for having published uh, material that uh, exposed some, of, some human rights abuses and some very serious uh, wrongdoings on behalf of the U.S. military. Um, and so it took roughly Ecuador two months to evaluate the information it had, and Ecuador came to the conclusion that there was indeed the possibility of a political persecution of Julian Assange for his journalistic activity and for his activities as a publisher. And there's been a whole narrative now trying to portray Assange as a hacker, but in fact Assange received material from sources, which is what journalists do, uh, he evaluated, WikiLeaks had all sorts of editorial mechanisms to evaluate whether, this, whether these sources were to be trusted, whether the material was quality, whether, and then made decisions as to whether they published or not. And in, in many occasions, the uh, material that was published uh, by WikiLeaks was then also published by mainstream media. So uh, WikiLeaks had agreements with The Guardian, The New York Times, The Le Monde, uh, the, El País, uh, German press, so on and so forth. Uh, and in that way, uh, WikiLeaks very much behaved like uh, a publisher and the activities were very much journalistic activities. Um, and so Assange was given 
political asylum because he was considered by the Ecuadorian state as being a whistleblower. And I think this is really important because in the narrative, some of the media, and certainly in the United States sort of national security narrative that we're seeing around Assange today, there's been a move away from Assange's rights, which should be protected by the Whistleblower Protection Act of 1989, which has to do with freedom of expression and journalism and so on, uh, to uh, trying to frame it within the legal framework of the 1916 Espionage Act. So trying to make it uh, sort of shifting the narrative from freedom of expression to spying. And uh, this is for us, was for us, and as we saw the narrative evolve, uh, a clear case of political persecution. Now, I believe you actually also had an opportunity to meet Assange in the embassy in London. And so I just wanted to ask, and now of course, this is probably not an issue that should be a factor in the decision to revoke his asylum. But still, I'd like to know, in your encounters with Assange, what were the conditions under which he was being held? And uh, what, was, what was the relationship like between Assange and the embassy at that time? Because obviously, it certainly has soured since then. Uh, and there was pretty serious allegations that Moreno was made, but I just wanted to know what was your impression of, you know, back then when you were uh, foreign minister, what was it like? I think Moreno's allegations are essentially a smokescreen because he has to try and, and sort of justify uh, this major breach of international law and the fact that Ecuador's once again become a sort of surrogate state, uh, very submissive to uh, the Trump administration in the United States. So I think there's a lot of contradictory information. Um, you mentioned earlier that uh, the British authority, that Moreno mentioned that the British authorities had promised uh, not to extradite uh, Julian Assange. We have seen no such document. I, mean, I know for a fact that those documents don't exist. It was a letter written last year by Boris Johnson, but it sort of very generally reassures Ecuador that it would not seek to extradite him somewhere where he could face death penalty, well, clearly that's not enough. I mean, uh, Julian Assange shouldn't, be, uh, shouldn't face any treatment, including the treatment that was faced by Chelsea Manning, which was denounced by including multilateral institutions as torture and uh, so on and so forth. So I think uh, there's a lot of smokescreen there. Now, as to his uh, conditions within the uh, embassy, they were always very difficult, always very precarious, he lived in a very small bedroom with very little natural light in a very small embassy with diplomatic personnel. The embassy was virtually under siege. I mean, for the first few years, there were, I think, 67 police officers outside, outside the Ecuadorian embassy. Uh, you know, a, a lot of pressure, uh, a lot of, I feel, interference. I mean, it was very difficult to make a phone call from the Ecuadorian embassy. You know, when you were inside there, you really felt that there was outside sort of, well, I mean, a euphemism would be presence and pressure. Uh, then they got rid of the police uh, presence, at least the sort of uniform police, but you know, still very much monitored. Um, no outside space, very little fresh air, um, which was one of the reasons why Ecuador was not against, uh, and it's you know, certainly after uh, the Swedish uh, case uh, was dropped and um, Mr. Assange still faced uh, this uh, jumping of bail, um, Ecuador said, well, you know, uh, Mr. Assange uh, could face the uh, British justice if he's jumped bail. It's usually sort of a, a, a minor consequences, sometimes a, a fine or a few days in jail or whatever it is. He would be much better in a British jail in terms of his, you know, having access to, to health, health care and, and, a, and a kind of a, a patio where you could have fresh air and so on. So there were no issues with that. The issue was always non extradition and getting guarantees non extradition. Whenever Ecuador asked for guarantees of non-extradition from Sweden, you know, Ecuador was very clear, he can go to Sweden, no problem, but we want guarantees of non-extradition. Whenever that was asked, the answer was, no, you can't have those guarantees. Uh, that was Sweden's answer for several years, and it was also Britain's answer uh, once the Swedish allegation, once the Swedish case uh, was dropped. And all this confirmed Ecuador's suspicion. Uh, and I think over time, Ecuador has been proven right. We're back square one, we're back to WikiLeaks, we're back to freedom of expression, we're back to whistleblowers. Uh, and yeah, confirming Ecuador's suspicions that it was indeed a case of political persecution. Okay. Well, we're going to leave it there for now. Uh, thanks so much. I was speaking to Guillaume Long, Ecuador's foreign minister under former president Rafael Correa. Thanks again, Guillaume, for having joined us today. Thank you for having me on the show.
And thank you for joining The Real News Network.